Pastor Dan's going to come now and uh, continue our series, Evidence of Faith. Dwayne, as, um, as I was sitting there, I, uh, I found myself overcome with uh, a, a new wave of emotion I haven't felt uh, in this journey. I, um, and there, I'll just tell you right up front, there's danger. Those of you on staff who've worked with me um, know that when I only have one sermon to preach uh, and there's not a clock to worry about, uh, there's, there's danger there. I don't need to be as stuck to my notes and worry about time. Um, but I, you know, I'm not an old guy. Uh, I will turn 38 next month. And so I'm not a sensitive population. Um, Dwayne is very sensitive, uh, very old. <laughs> But I've, I've been a part of this church for 38 years. And uh, it, it, the weight of this moment occurs to me that uh, in all of those years, we've never had a, a morning like this, where I'm looking at maybe 100 of you today. And uh, there's well over 1,000 of you at home. Um, this, these are unique times for us. And so we have, we have some notes for a sermon. And, um, but one of the things I learned a long time ago as a preacher that when things seem overwhelming, we just hide behind scripture. So I have all intentions of hiding behind scripture and being very open to the Holy Spirit today. Um, I am reminded of a handful of different things. First, uh, 2 Timothy chapter one says that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but God has given us a spirit of power and of love and of sound mind. And in this season that we find ourselves in as followers of Jesus, as a country, we need to be people, as, as, a, as a globe, right? As humanity, we need to be people, not of fear, but of power, God's power, of God's love, and of sound mind. And as Dwayne mentioned in his prayer earlier, uh, the, the words of Psalms 46, verse 10, um, God says to you and I today and over and over again in the days ahead, be still. I like that reminder. Be still and know that I am God. I need to be reminded on days like this that our God is greater, as we sang, our God is bigger. He's in charge. He is still on his throne, that it's okay to be still and trust that he's in charge. And here's one more before we dive into our message. Isaiah 41. God says to you and I, do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. Like he created the thing. <laughs> do, he does not grow tired and weary. He will not stumble and fall. But those who trust in the Lord, those who trust in the Lord will not grow tired and weary. They will not grow faint. They will run on wings like eagles. They will walk and not grow faint. So I'm going to pray, and we're going to dive in to what God, I think, is leading us to today. Father, Holy Spirit, come, Lord Jesus, come. We need to be led by you. We want to be the church that you've called us to be. We want to be filled with love and compassion. We want to be filled with hope and trust. We want to be wise and discerning. We want to be led by you. So lead us today, in the days ahead, and in the weeks ahead, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. So, um, our faith, our faith is a faith that um, is, is rooted in Scripture, right? Right? I mean, I told you, I just said, I'm gonna hide behind scripture today. Um, and that's a good thing, right? The, the, this book that we follow, the Holy Bible, is the greatest book ever written. It, is, uh, it has changed the world unlike any other text in all of history. Furthermore, we believe that it is alive and active. We believe that it has power to transform. We believe it is more than just a book. But from time to time, uh, maybe I'm just speaking for myself, but some of us, from time to time, we can, we can get kind of caught up in the rules. We can get kind of caught up in the regulations and the commands. And we can miss the heart behind why these words were written. We can miss the who uh, wrote them and who he wrote them to and why these words are important. And at times, we can place the commands over compassion 
And if you're anything like me from time to time, I'll actually put those rules, those commands on other people and I'll use them as an excuse to judge. I'll use them as an excuse not to be compassionate, not to be loving. And what we're gonna see today in our time with Jesus is that can be a problem. And we wanna, we wanna lean into who Jesus is and we wanna lean into why he wrote these words and what these words are all about and, 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 and his intentions for us, okay? So if you've ever gotten caught up in this place where you've placed the commands over compassion, well, you're in the right place today as we go into Bible study. Now, if you haven't been with us, we've been looking, we've been in this series called Evidence of the Faith. And what we're doing is we're looking at this old man, John, the apostle John. John was one of Jesus's 12. He was one of those early disciples who walked with Jesus, who did life and faith with Jesus. And he was there with him. He saw it all. He heard it all. And he writes this particular gospel that we've been, been, that we were in, the gospel of John. He writes it at the end of his life and he finds himself at an interesting place. He's seen his savior, Jesus. He's seen him die. He saw him rise from the grave. He saw him ascend to the heavens. He saw it all with his own eyes. But not only is Jesus no longer with him in bodily form, the very disciples that he did life with, that he helped start the church with, are no longer on this planet. They've all died out. They've all been killed. And the apostle John is now the very last of Jesus's 12 that still lives and walks and moves on this planet and at the end of his life, and, and we understand that the, the time in which he was living, it was a tumultuous time. He was in exile. The Caesar at that point was a terrible man who had it out for him. The world as, as, as kind of everyone who followed Jesus around, it was kind of uncertain, unsettled. But John writes these words. He writes these five different books of the Bible to a people who are kind of on edge, to a people who are like, what, what do we do? How do we do these things? And so he writes the book of Revelation, this powerful vision. He writes 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And he writes this particular gospel, this story of who Jesus is, how he lived, and, and, and what he taught. But what's fascinating about John and what's fascinating, kind of this macro lesson we've been learning in the series, is that John did not choose to follow Jesus because of faith. We, like, we talk about putting your faith in Jesus but, but what we've seen in this journey is that John, told, John chose to follow Jesus because of what he saw, because of what he heard. He, he, and, and, and actually, he says it best in his own words. Let's look at 1 John chapter 1. He says this. He says that that which was from the beginning, that which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, like John saw these things unfold, which we have looked at with our hands, which we have touched, this we proclaim to you concerning the word of life. Next slide. Oh God, you're going to make me work harder today. Uh, concerning the word of life, verse two, the life appeared, Jesus, we have seen it and we testify to it and we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and appeared to us. We proclaim to you which we have seen and which we have heard so that you may have fellowship with us and our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. So what John is saying, he saw it. He heard these things. And it was because of what he saw. It was because of what he heard that he put his faith in Jesus, that he believed in Jesus. His belief didn't just come from faith. His belief came from what he saw and what he heard. And he now writes all these things down so that you and I can believe just based on what he saw and heard. In fact, he says this at the end of, of John's gospel, verse 20, uh, chapter 20, verse 31, it says this, but these are written, these words that he wrote down are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So John wants you and I to, to take all the things that he saw, all the things that he, sur that he heard and put our faith in this Jesus who rocked his world and who ultimately would turn the world upside down. And so each week we've been looking at these different signs, each of them kind of pointing to who is Jesus? Oh, he, oh he's the Messiah. He's, he's God. He's the Lord. Pay attention to him. Live like him. Follow him. Put, put your faith in him. 
And today we come to the third of those signs. And this one happens in John chapter five. If you brought your Bibles, we're gonna spend a lot of time here this morning in John chapter five. And, and it's gonna be, you know, if you have your Bibles, maybe it'll be titled the healing at the pool. Some translations call it the healing on the Sabbath. But the, the, but the reason that's significant to us is we're gonna see the day it happened, the, this moment it happened and where it happened are very significant. So turn with me to verse one. It says this. Now, sometime later, and this is happening right after the last sign that we just talked about last week. We're just kind of continuing on. Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Now, there in Jerusalem, near the Sheep Gate, a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethsaida, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here, a great number of disabled people used to lie the blind, the lame, and the paralyzed. Now, tradition has it that there was a, um, uh, this pool that, that from time to time, the waters would be stirred up. And when the waters stirred up, well, well, the people believed that they had this superstition that that's when kind of things got a little magical. So they wanted to be in the waters and that the healing power kind of was stirred up when the waters got stirred up. Now, what's interesting about all of this is that um, as later, many years later, as this very real site was excavated, they found a very real um, uh, spring underneath this site. So this, this really all happened. It's, it's just fascinating. Um, but, but, but think about a couple different things. To be an invalid... To be ill, to be crippled like this at this point, it was, it was a virtual death sentence. This was a culture that um, superstition put it that, that if, um, if, if you sinned or if somebody in your family sinned or if they did something wrong, that's kind of why you were broken. That's kind of why you had whatever disease or illness or ailment. So this was a society that looked at illness and said, no, we're not going to have anything to do with you. We're going to turn our backs away from you. Who sinned? Your, 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 did, your, did you sin or did your parents sin? Like that's, that's how these people who were sick and invalid were ostracized. And so there, there's, there's this place that, that is here in Jerusalem and all these sick people gathered there. And, and you can just picture it in, in a world without much medicine, in a world where doctors were scarce and people were, were left on their own. Can you imagine how desperate this place would have been? Can you imagine the smell of this place? It was a horrific, painful, uh, a, a desperate place. But this is where Jesus went. This is where Jesus went. He went to the place where the sick and the dying were all hanging out. Now, verse five, there was one who was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. I'm about to turn 38, I said a second ago. Um, I, that's like a lifetime. Can you imagine, can you imagine being an invalid for 38 years? And it says in verse six that Jesus saw him lying there and he learned that he had been in this condition for a very long time. And so get this, as we come into our third scene, this third moment that, that John is going to show us and point to the fact that, hey, you wanna know who Jesus is? Uh, Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the Lord. Put your faith and trust in him. This whole scene, this whole moment is going to revolve around this person who lives in desperation, this little person who lives in hopelessness, in sickness. And this is when Jesus sees the opportunity for a sign. And what does he ask him? He says in, at the end of verse six, do you want to get well? Now that's an interesting question, isn't it? Why would Jesus ask this man who's been sick and an invalid for 38 years, do you wanna get well? Like, have you ever thought about some of the questions that Jesus asks the people he encounters? Like, they seem like no-brainers, right? But think with me for just a moment. Have you ever known somebody who struggled with something for so long that they actually don't want to do the work to get help? Maybe you've, you've known somebody who's been a part of the recovery community. 
Sometimes actually getting help, getting healing, getting recovery requires hard work. You're kind of used to operating the way you've always done. You know, if we actually did get well at this point, that might upset the apple cart a little bit. But Jesus, not one to impose his will on another, asks you and I, do we, do we want to get well? Do you want to be transformed by him? Do you want to live in his real, true, rich, new life? Do you? Because you have a choice. You want to move closer to him or just stay how things have been. Do you want to get well, he asked them. And it says in verse 7, the man replied, Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. And while I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. It's a picture of desperation, isn't it? No one's there to take care of this man. He just lays there day in and day out for all those years. And because of these waters that would be stirred up from time to time and this superstition, all of a sudden the waters would start stirring up. And you can just imagine the commotion amongst the ranks as, as people just try to get in. And, 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 and it's a, I, I, I just, I can't fully wrap my, rant, my mind around how horrible it would have been. Because if you could get in, what's the guarantee that you could get out? Like if you're that, if you're that much of an invalid, if you're that paralyzed, like it's, it's a horrible scene that Jesus comes to as he talks to this man and he says, I, I don't have anybody. I'm all alone. The world has turned its back on me. The world has t- had turned its back on people like him. And it says in verse eight that Jesus said to him, get up. And, and the, 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 the word in the original Greek language here is literally wake up or rise up. Like, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna start something fresh here. Get up, Jesus says to him, and then pay attention to these next words. Pick up your mat and walk. Now that all sounds very straightforward to us, right? There's nothing to, ah, okay, get up, okay, arise, wake up, okay, we got it. And, but, but Jesus wants him to pick up his mat which again, I could tangent on that all day long. What's this? He wants to take the mat that I've been on for all these. That's gross. Okay, whatever, Jesus. And walk with the mat. Okay, okay, we'll come back to this. We'll come back. Verse nine. At once, the man was cured and he picked up his mat and he walked. Now at this point, we see Jesus actually disappears. Like, like he sneaks away in the crowd. Like he, he, he's, he's intentionally starting to hit the hornet's nest because as we're gonna see, the religious people, the Pharisees, the people who had put the commands over compassion, they're about to get riled up because as it says in, at the end of verse nine, the day on which this took place was a Sabbath. A big no-no at this point. It says in verse 10, and so the Jewish leaders said to the man who had been healed, it is the Sabbath. The law forbids you to carry your mat. Now slow down with me for just a minute. Understand from what we know of scripture, it's not the law that forbid him to carry his mat. It's tradition. Now, what they're referring to is the law comes from, you know, the fourth command of the the great commandments, right? Honoring the Sabbath and and keeping it holy. But what what the the Pharisees and the Jewish people at this time had done is they they put all these extra rules around the different commands, specifically with the Sabbath. The the Sabbath at this point had these, uh, as a part of the oral Torah at this point, had 39 categories of things that you could not do on the Sabbath, Can you imagine that? So go to the original law in the Old Testament and when it says honor the Sabbath, it doesn't say anything about mats, but the Jewish people in their fear of breaking the command put all of these extra categories of things around the the, the law that they didn't want anyone to break. And so this community, this system comes to him and says, no, you are sinning. You are in violation. The point of the commandment was to take a break on labor, not to take a break on compassion or love. And so this moment we find ourselves in where Jesus is kind of doing all this stuff, this moment is, is, is kind of what happens when, when you and I forget the why behind the what. When we forget why the commandment was written, why Jesus gave it to us, who it was for. And you know what? You and I do this in our different systems here on this planet today, right? Don't we? 
some of, our, some of our religious systems, some of our theological systems, some of our ideological systems, even, dare I say, our political systems, when we forget why they were put together and when we forget the people that they were meant to serve, when we get all distracted on the, the little details and we forget the people that they were designed to serve, that's what we see here, this judgmental, critical place that, that they found themselves in at this point in history. But what we see in John's letter is, is that John would write in a different place in his gospel that God so loved hmm, people. And so when we build our systems around rules and regulations and commands at the neglect and the care and compassion for people, well, it seems that this particular day, uh, Jesus was hitting the hornet's nest and the Pharisees were getting all riled up. But it's in this moment, as Jesus reminds his people that compassion, that love, that care is sometimes more important than the regulations and the rules that other people put around them. And so it says in verse 11, but he replied, the man who made me well said, pick up your mat and Walk. So at this point, the man doesn't even know who Jesus is. He just knows this guy told me these things. And you know what? I've been sitting here for 38 years. I'm going to get up. The guy said, and it worked. I'm, okay, you guys are mad at me. You're not, you're, I'm sorry. I'm just doing what he told me to do. Verse 12. And so they asked him, who is this fellow who told you to pick up your mat and walk? which is exactly the question he needed to be asking. It's exactly the question we need to be asking. Who does Jesus think he is to be telling these people to be turning the system upside down? And it says in verse 13 that the man who was healed had no idea who it was for Jesus had slipped away into the crowd and was there. Now, we're, we're about to step into is one of those moments uh, where, where every commentary is going to, that, that you could go to. And a commentary is this book that you can kind of read. What is, what is the Bible talking about here at this moment? Every commentary that you would read about what we're going to see next says something along the lines of, well, it's complicated. Like, like basically they have no idea what is happening, uh, what we're about to read next. Okay, it's going to be a great turn. But here's what I want to suggest to you. And Pastor Anley Stanley, who we've really leaned into a lot for this series, would say, don't read this next part like a theologian, read it like a human, okay? So, so, so don't, don't try to be this Bible scholar for me for just a moment. Let's read it like real life humans, like we all are here in the room and online today, okay? Watch what happens. This is brilliant, it's brilliant. Okay, it says, verse 14. Later Jesus found him at the temple and he said to him, this is the man, right? He said to him, see, you are well again. Stop sinning. Now, what's that all about? This is where, again, the commentaries, well, it's complicated. You know, we don't really know. But, but here's one idea that I've heard a couple people suggest. It's a joke. It's a joke. Because think for just for a moment. Not only has this guy not done anything wrong for 38 years, he hasn't done anything like he's just been sitting there and now he's being accused of sinning. So Jesus comes along and says, hey, hey, uh, uh, um, he says, see, you are well again. Stop sinning. Here's, here's why we think we can, we can make this a joke. Next part, he says, or something worse may happen to you. What is worse punishment than being stuck laying on his back for 38 years? Like, <laughs> yeah, don't sin anymore because if you do, uh, you, what's worse than being stuck on a mat for 38 years? Here's the punchline. Here's the punchline. And we'll, uh, I have a quote up here from Andy Stanley. He says this, when you recognize who Jesus is, you will lose your fear of religion and religious people. You see, this man on the mat had finally encountered the real Jesus. The man on the mat didn't care so much about all the rules and the regulations and the commands. He just knew he met Jesus. He just knew Jesus told him what to do and he did it. And in Jesus, he found life. And in Jesus, he could walk again. And so sorry if that didn't fit into your system, but I'm gonna do what Jesus told me to do. And, the, and it, what occurs to me is that so many of us are so bound up by our guilt related to religious systems that we miss out on living the real life that Jesus invites us to. 
to. When you and I choose to follow Jesus, religion will lose its grip on us. Religion will lose its grip on you. Verse 15. The man went away and he told the Jewish leaders what it was, that it was Jesus who had made him well. And so because Jesus was doing these things on the Sabbath, the Jewish leaders began to persecute him. In this, in his defense, Jesus said to him, to them, my father is always at his work to this very day. I too am working, which is great because it's the Sabbath, right? And the Sabbath, as we see, it's for, for God's creation, for his people. But he kind of reminds them that, oh yeah, God is always at working. And in case you didn't realize it, God, well, he's my father too. And you know, we're always working. We're always about the father's business. Verse 18, for this reason, They tried all the more to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal to God. It's like, who does this guy think he is? Exactly. And that's the question that they needed to wrestle with. And it's the question that you and I need to wrestle with today. Who do you think this man is? Who do you think this Jesus is that John is recording all of this stuff that he saw with his very own eyes? Do you, do you, do you, do you see that he is not some ordinary man? Do you see that he has power? Do you see that he brings life? Do you see that he turns the apple cart of systems and, and worldviews on its head? Do you see that he's inviting people to a new way of living? And furthermore, he's calling himself the son of God. Furthermore, he's basically saying he's the Messiah. He is. Is God. God is his father. He's making himself equal to God. Verse 19, and Jesus gave them this answer. Very truly, I tell you, the son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees his father doing because whatever the father does, the son also does. And so Jesus is saying, do you, do you want to know what God is really like? He's saying, well, you know, look at me. You want to know what God is really like? He's saying, watch Jesus, watch me. You, you, you want to understand what, what, what God is like? Listen to me. Do you want to know what God would actually do in your situation, in your life? Just follow me. And later, later on, a few verses down in verse 39, he says this. Jesus says, you study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me. And yet you refuse to come to me and have life. You see at the beginning of John's gospel in John chapter one, verse 14, it says that the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. It's as though Jesus is saying, I'm standing right here in front of you. Your scriptures that you've been reading, your scriptures that you've been studying are pointing to me, are pointing to Jesus. And John is saying, I gazed into the eyes of this man, Jesus. I saw him, I watched him. I listened to him. And in Jesus, I found my God. I found my Lord and my Messiah. And I put my faith in him. I followed him. And today we can look at that same Jesus through the same eyes of the scriptures. And Jesus would say to you and I that he is our living commentary. That, that, and, and, and honestly, this is why the gospels are so important to us. They're important because God made it simple. In a world with so many different ideas, in a world that tries to complicate things, God makes it simple. He showed up. He spoke up. And and he was clear. And when our God came in the flesh, Jesus Christ, not only uh, did he come as the Savior and the Messiah, he brought with him an idea that would forever turn the world upside down. And today it's the same idea that if you and I put it into practice, it can shape, it can continue to shape and alter Western civilization. And here it is, that the you beside you that person next to you, that neighbor we've been talking about, 
that stranger, that friend, that uh, 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 random person, that person we find hurting and broken, that other person, the other, the you beside you. Jesus would say to us that that you must take priority, must be important to us, must matter to us over whatever potentially flawed views that you carry inside of you. And think for just a moment as we, as we, as we go back to this scene. As we go back to this scene, there was all of these hurting and broken invalid and infirmed people who the the world and the religious systems had turned their back on. And it was in this scene of desperation, hurt and pain that Jesus showed up and John chose to point us to, hey, hey, do you have any question about who this guy is? He's the Messiah, he's the King. It all happens in this place where Jesus expresses care and compassion to people that the world had turned their back on. And so the idea that, that, has, that, 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 that Jesus set into motion all those years ago and that idea that you and I can continue to, to keep moving forward in this era that we find ourselves in is that the you beside you must take priority over whatever potentially flawed views that we carry inside of us. And think with me for just a moment. Is there anything right now that you might be wrong about? Let me ask you this way. 10 years ago, have your views changed at all in the last 10 years? Have your convictions, your beliefs about something changed in the last 10 years? Those of you who are younger, like, no, I'm in my 20s. Where'd Haley Joe go? I know you're here somewhere. Ah, there you are. I'm in my 20s. Maybe, I don't know, maybe you're 19. Uh, but has something changed in the last couple of years? Uh, do you believe something differently today than you believed, say, when you were in middle school? And so here's what I would suggest to you. These religious people, they didn't know better. They they thought they knew what they were doing. But you and I have Jesus to look to today. And so as we read our scriptures, as we study, as we learn, the this, this, this sacred text is amazing and powerful. But if we get so caught up on the commands that we miss the who, the who the scriptures are written for, that we miss the who wrote the scriptures, that we miss the who that Jesus came in the flesh to demonstrate, this is how you live out your faith. This is how you, dem- this is how you live out your life. The you beside you must take priority over the potentially flawed view that you carry around inside of you. So in this unique place we find ourselves as followers of Jesus, it's easy to get caught up into some of these ideologies, some of these worldviews that says, I'm not even gonna name them because you know what they are right now. But if those ideologies, if those worldviews, if our Christianity, if our faith takes us to to a place that, that basically says, I don't care about you guys over here, we miss the mark. We miss the mark. Because the faith that Jesus walked is a faith that loved and cared and was compassionate for other people. Let me ask you this question. Does your version of religion or politics ever get in the way of loving people that God loves? And it was going to be a lot easier to hit you on politics today before the world kind of blew up this week. But, um, but that's one of the fascinating things about moments like this. In moments like this, when everything goes upside down, we're forced to ask the question, what matters most? And I would suggest to you putting your full faith in Jesus, following him wholeheartedly, doing what Jesus would do. You know, over the years... Over the years, as our world has has entered into dangerous and scary and uncertain times, it has been followers of Jesus who have stepped up and lived like Jesus that have changed the world. And I don't know what that looks like for us in this season. We're still in early, who knows how this thing's gonna play out tomorrow, right? But followers of Jesus put their faith, put their trust in him, and they put loving others, care and compassion on the forefront Does your version of Christianity ever get in the way of loving people that God loves? If so, I would suggest to you that you are at odds with God. Does your theological system ever get in the way of loving people that God loves? Does your ideology, does your political system, does your party loyalty ever get in the way of loving people that God loves? If so, you might be at odds with God. 
because as this, this man who followed Jesus so closely, the apostle John wrote, God is love. And so when you get on the wrong side of love, I would suggest to you that you get on the wrong side of God. So if you're, if you're, re, listen to this, if your religion or your politics give you permission to mistreat another person, oh, I could say, you know, if we weren't so distracted by all this other stuff, I could linger here for a little bit. Tell you what, tell you what. If your religion or your politics gives you permission to mistreat another person, then you are on the wrong side of God. Trying to stay focused here. Trying to stay focused. First John chapter four says this. Dear friends, let us love one another for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. There's a story, um, I, I did, dug into it just a little bit. It's just kind of a legend about the, the, this man, this old man, John, that writes all these things that we've been looking at today. And the story goes that at the end of his life that, that he, he, he hardly said anything. They would carry him to different uh, places, different religious gatherings, different church gatherings, and, and inevitably people would come to him and, and ask him to say something. And the tradition goes that he would say the same thing over and over again as he is, his, 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 his energy was growing weak. He said, he would say, little children love one another, which again, if you look at his gospel, if you look at first, second and third John, you would see this is his heart. The man who watched Jesus closely, who saw the Messiah demonstrate how to live life. Little children love one another. And he was asked, a teacher, why do you always say this? And he replied with a line, uh, with this line. He says, because it is the Lord's commandment. And if it alone is kept, it is sufficient. So my friends, my intention today was to just challenge us to ask the deep questions. Have you put your faith in the Jesus that John has talked about the Jesus who demonstrated over and over again that he is the son of God, the Messiah. And then my intention today was to push us to say, okay, as, as we watch Jesus, what are we seeing? And we're seeing a, a Jesus who wants to get near the broken, get near the hurting, get near the lost and love well and, sh and, and express compassion, express care. So I don't know what this week has for us, but here's what I do know. We as the church, we as followers of Jesus need to lean into our trust. We need to lean into our prayer and we need to wrestle with and discern how do we care for and love those around us who are hurting, who are broken, who are isolated, who need you to be the hands and feet of Jesus right now. How about I pray for us and then we worship some more, okay? <clears throat> God, in this, in this moment, it has just felt like an overwhelming, and it's felt like a, a time, like, what do you say? But to turn to Jesus, to watch our Messiah, our Lord, interact with the very people that, well, scripture says that you love so much. God, would you give us a fresh hope today? Would you give us a fresh trust today? Would you help us to be wise while not walking in fear? Would you empower us afresh with your spirit, with your wisdom, with your truth? And God, help us to know this week and in the weeks ahead what love requires of us. Help us to know how to love well, how to care well, how to reach out well, we want to be your hands and feet on this planet right now. Lead us and empower us by your spirit, we pray in Jesus' name.